Hello and welcome to Showcase, TR2 World's daily arts and culture show coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Two centuries ago, a philosopher, social reformer and naturalist was born. We'll pay tribute to Henry David Thoreau later in the program. And we'll also check out China's classical music scene as a new generation of conductors and musicians take center stage. But first... <music> Plucked from the past, the Malaysian gambus stands the test of time as it echoes the country's rich musical history. Jack! The ghost is back! And famed horror writer Sergio Sanchez is back, this time cutting his directing teeth with a new thriller. And touching is believing, Santiago's inclusive street art made for the visually impaired. In Chile, a new scheme is hoping to make street art inclusive for all. Six murals have been created in one of the most touristic areas of the capital, Santiago. But as Miranda Addy tells us, this is art with a twist. This area of Santiago is filled with art. But ordinarily, Chile's blind community would have no idea. That's changing now, thanks to relief plaques like this and braille like this. It gives us great satisfaction to be able, in the future, to see the art that's being made. This is game-changing, especially in light of the large number of people in Chile suffering some form of disability. According to a national study on disability, it's around 2.8 million people. It allows you to level opportunities. If I'm blind and another person has no visual disability and we're facing a mural, contemplating it, we'll both have an equal opportunity to contemplate it. One of the murals is La Debutante by famous Chilean artist Roberto Mata. This tactile plate is a two-scale translation of the work, and there's also a description in Braille. Many people believe these tactile plaques are for the blind only, but I don't believe that's true. I believe that these plaques, as well as other inclusive elements that one can create around art, allow us to perceive art through another sense. By creating miniature mural plaques and including a unique description in Braille, all visitors, whether visually impaired or not, have the chance to experience art using senses other than sight. So when do you think the best time to watch a horror movie is? On a warm summer afternoon where you can walk back into the light or a cold winter night with the darkness of what you just saw following you outside. Spanish filmmaker Sergio G. Sanchez clearly favors summertime, as you can see with his latest project. We have come very far, enduring many hardships, but at last we found the place where we can be safe. A period thriller set in the late 1960s with four siblings in the lead. The Secret of Marrowbone follows a young family that moves to an old family house in rural America to start a new life after an undisclosed trauma. But restarting a life with a big secret won't be easy when a mysterious character from their past comes to visit. This is the first feature film directed by screenwriter Sergio G. Sanchez, who is best known for the Goya Award winner, The Orphanage. I wrote the script after I, I, I lost uh, someone very young in, in my family uh, to a horrible disease. And, and it was that, that departure and that, that sense of, of void that she left in our family sort of uh, springing uh, 
this this idea in my head of how everyone you love becomes a part of you and how you also become part of, of, of the people who are around you and how your personality somehow becomes uh, the sum of everyone you know and, and you love. So from this theme, I try to build a, a, a horror a horror story. And so my producer told me just, because uh, usually I take too long in, in the writing process, and she just told me, why don't you try just putting three pages out every day, see what happens. And strangely enough, I had uh, a first draft in, in, in three weeks. We're not alone. While the story is set in a fictional location in Maine, the film actually was shot in the Asturias in Spain over three months, a period actors called a dream. It was wonderful for the time, like, we had so many lovely, happy memories, but then I kind of think it's all the better as well for the harrowing bits too. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the whole experience was a dream. I, I don't think anyone, any of us could have anticipated the, the summer we would have had that year. Um, but we really um, formed a deep bond and, and we really did become a family. What are we going to do? The Secret of Marrowbone, which also stars Anya Taylor-Joy and Charlie Heaton, is set to release in the UK on July 13. After sailing more than 5,000 kilometers through choppy seas, it wasn't long after arriving on Malaysian shores that the gambus was quickly embraced. Similar to an oud, the guitar-like instrument has given birth to its own musical genre and remains a way for both older and younger generations to express themselves through music, the almost forgotten sounds of the not-so-distant past. Abdullah is a professional musician who plays the gambas. The traditional Malaysian instrument was introduced centuries ago by Muslim merchants who sailed from Yemen. We call in Malaysia is gambus. Uh, the origin of this gambus uh, is from Yemen, Hadramaut. But now we have changed it, uh, its name to Gambus Johor because many makers and play, uh, Gambus players are from Johor. And then uh, in Malaysia we have two types of Gambus. The one is Gambus Hadramaut and this one. And the smaller one we call it as a Gambus Melayu. Uh, I choose this instrument, Gambus, because I fall in love with, with this uh, sound. The sound is very nice and also it is important to the Malaysian or traditional Malay music in a genre of Zapin and also Ghazal. So this genre of music, uh, they use gambus as a main instrument. During one of his travels to Turkey, Abdullah met a musician who plays oud, which he says is very similar to the gambus. The difference between uh, Arabic oud and the Malaysian gambus, uh, first is the material use. We use Malaysian wood and uh, the Arabic, they use uh, plenty types of wood that from all around the world. And then uh, the size and the design is a little bit different from Arab wood and uh, Malaysian gambus. And then the most important thing is the sound itself. The voice uh, there is different with uh, Arabic wood and with Malaysian uh, gambus. Abdullah not only plays the gambus, but he also makes the instruments at his own workshop. In uh, making process, gambus making process, 
Actually, we do several parts uh, from the head. Then, then we made the neck. We call this the neck. And then we go to the body. And last, we make the soundboard. This is soundboard. Then we, we fix it together. Uh, we finish with a shellac or a, any finish, finishing uh, you can uh, use. Then you put the string, wood string, here you can play. For the elder generation here in Malaysia, the gambus is still their cultural instrument of choice. The first time I heard about gambus was from this group called Seri Maharani Muar. At that time, it was not known, and I was attracted to gambus when I was nine. Today I am 57 years old, and I hope gambus will be introduced to the whole world. As Abdullah enjoys making and playing the gambus, he also makes sure to pass his knowledge by teaching the young generation how to play. I want to keep it alive with our traditional music, he told us. Still to come on Showcase, Walden Revisited. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. We'll take a look at the life and legacy of Henry David Thoreau. After long relying on Western conductors, China is now ready to promote its very own. Okay, don't look down. That was dumb. The Rock returns with, no surprise here, another big budget blockbuster. Before we bring you those, here are a few other arts and culture stories from around the world. London's National Gallery has bought a painting by the pioneering female artist Artemisia Gentileschi for almost $5 million, breaking a record for her work. With the addition of self-portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria, the gallery now has 20 works by female artists in its collection of more than 2,300 paintings. <laughs> England is out of the World Cup, but it has brought an unlikely item back into fashion, the form-fitting waistcoat that England's team manager Gareth Southgate donned at every match became a good luck charm for England. British retailer Marks & Spencer, the official suit supplier to the team since 2007, said the so-called Gareth Southgate effect has seen waistcoat sales recently double in the UK. He thought the wilderness to be the perfect tonic for the human soul, and walking through it, the highest pursuit possible. I'm speaking of Henry David Thoreau poet, essayist, and philosopher whose seminal works, including Walden, have etched their mark into the hearts and minds of countless generations. Born nearly 200 years ago this week, his words remain immortal, as does his spirit.
My guest today is known for taking Thoreau on the road, so to speak. He's performed his one-man dramatic show titled A Visit from Henry David Thoreau hundreds of times across the United States. When he's not doing that, Kevin Radiker is a professor of English at Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana. Thanks so much for being with us today. Now, Thoreau is best known for his book, Walden, which is a reflection upon simple living in natural surroundings. How did his personal re life reflect uh, in his writing? Well, Henry was very jealous of his personal time. He was a carpenter, he was a surveyor, he was a pencil maker. He helped his father with the pencil factory. But Thoreau cared a great deal about simplifying his life, about studying nature. So he uh, spent as little time as he needed to, to earn money to, uh, er, to pay his debts. And uh, this is one way in which he simplified his life. He concentrated on the things that he was passionate about and did not allow himself to become too involved in other matters. Why did he believe uh, so strongly in the transformative power of nature? Well, Henry writes, in nature I find the reality that I seek. I suppose that the value I find in walking into nature is equivalent to what others get by going to church and praying. From a very early age, we find evidence that Thoreau felt the divine power, felt the creator in the natural world. And he, like many others, especially the transcendentalists, uh, believed that he could find the divine, he could find God in nature. Nature was a way by which to uh, make contact with the sacred truths of our universe. Mm -hmm. Now, he wasn't just a poet, he was also a politician who lobbied for the elimination of slavery and actually participated in the uh, Underground Railroad. Absolutely. Uh, we, we think that he probably helped many more runaway slaves than we will ever be sure about, but he certainly was a part of the Underground Railroad. He spoke out several times against uh, slavery, very strongly at times. And of course, his most famous essay is now called, by most people, Civil Disobedience, urging people to consider a nonviolent protest. Yes, um, now you step into Thoreau's skin during your performance uh, of A Visit from Henry David Thoreau. How did you get into uh, doing these performances? How did I get started? Way back in 1990, a mentor of mine at Pennsylvania State University, where I received my PhD, urged me to try out for the part with the Great Plains Summer Chautauqua Tour. And that's how it started. And I've been in many tours since, and I've had many individual performances, as you said, around the nation. Well, Kevin, if you don't mind, would you recite some of your favorite lines uh, that Thoreau wrote back in the day? The true harvest of my daily life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It is a little stardust caught, a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. Those sentences alone, I think, help us, if we have not read much of Thoreau, to understand how passionate he could be about our daily lives, our daily experiences, and especially the ways by which the creation, the natural world, can affect us, can influence us, inspire us. Thoreau was so passionate about the natural world. Uh, but he was also passionate about simply the miracles that each of us can experience every day. And that's why he wrote also, uh, surely joy is the condition of life. These lines have influenced me as well. He's helped me realize uh, how miraculous and wonderful life can be. So he's clearly had an effect on your personal life as well, hasn't he? I would have to say that my commitment to various environmental causes has been influenced a great deal by Thoreau my commitment to try and to simplify my life as much as I can, not to get my, commit myself to too many uh, tasks, which is not always easy as an academic and as a father. But I also appreciate, uh, as I just said, the ways by which he could find miracles around him. The transcendentalists were well known for that. Uh, many, I think, religious persons throughout history around the world have realized the great miraculous powers uh, around us and within us. And Thoreau is certainly one of those kind of writers. All right, Kevin Radiker, thank you so much for joining us today in remembering the very influential Henry David Thoreau. My pleasure, thank you.
strongly attached to its traditions as it is, China has come a long way when it comes to music. It wasn't that long ago when Western music was banned across the country. But this next story is one example of how things are changing. With a growing number of symphony orchestras and foreign trained conductors, classical music is no longer considered an import product in China. Zeynep Gökçe tells us why. Tuning their instruments ahead of a performance, the Guangzhou Symphony Orchestra is one of 80 of its kind in China, but that number was around 30 just eight years ago. Classical music is making its way in the country, but the repertoire is often limited to great composers such as Beethoven, Bach and Brahms. Uh, why are you playing uh, classical music in the West? You are mm, playing these pieces for audiences who have heard this many, many times before. Um, but here, uh, many times people listen to music for the first time. After long relying on Western conductors, many symphony orchestras around the country are now handing the baton to a new generation of Chinese music directors. In China, during I'm in the Central Conservatory of Music, we are always focused on the, the uh, basically technique. So the technically, we are very strong. I can tell you that. But uh, during I'm uh, in America, during that time, um, more experience. We have a lot of chance to, to do the orchestra piece and then different genre and then we uh, focus on the, the background about the music. But China's music students are most interested in becoming soloists. That's, that problem does exist because in, in all the conservatories in China uh, we are training people to become soloists and that is of course the highest highest aspiration for any performers or any singers the country hopes to gain global recognition in the field that might take time but until then their show must go on hot on the heels of the success of the epic video game adaptation rampage Wrestler-turned-actor Dwayne Johnson sets out to rule the box office once again. The award-winning performer switches gears, this time to take on a role set in one single, claustrophobic setting. Steve McQueen and Paul Newman race against time. Star-studded thrillers set in high-tech buildings making up the skyline has been a cash cow for movie studios for decades. I never would have my kids. Daddy loves who? Me. Daddy loves who? Me. Me. I love you. The latest such feature sees Hollywood icon Dwayne Johnson as a former FBI agent living in the safest high-rise in Hong Kong, a city known for its unique silhouette thanks to similar architecture. In Skyscraper, the California native plays a security advisor who must fight villains after an important flash drive is hidden in the confines of the 240-story building. Johnson, a player who is accustomed to both demanding action-adventure filmmaking and box office success, says his latest offering would deliver all the goods. Sarah, listen to me. The fire is not going to stop. Keep going up. Don't stop. Don't look back. The best experience, and I honestly mean this, is, um, is audiences' reactions to the movie. Uh, you know, you make a movie, you hope it's good. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, and we got lucky, because this one is really good, and fans like yourself and everybody who's been seeing the movie so far have really loved it. Okay, don't look down. The production unites Johnson with former collaborator Rawson Marshall Thurber, who directed the Tinseltown elite in the critically acclaimed comedy Central Intelligence. Uh, jumped off a super crane. What? Uh, made a lot of comedies uh, coming up to this one, and uh, I wanted to make an action movie since I was uh, about eight years old. Uh, and so Skyscraper uh, represents a lot of my sort of eight-year-old boy action fantasies all put into one movie. Just the man I was looking for. This building is protecting something that I want. Skyscraper also received envy from competition for landing a July release date in China a slot that is usually reserved for domestic features that are expected to hit big. 
And with that, we wrap up another episode of Showcase. You can head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Efnan Han. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.